Welcome, everyone. We are ready to start. I am Christine Brown. I work here in the Outreach and Interpretation Program. Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> Um, today, I'm here to introduce a talk by Brenda Waller uh, about Montana's history of horse racing, which is fascinating, intriguing, and revealing, and she has done so much great research. We're going to have a great time with her uh, today. Um, first, a little bit about Brenda. She's a fourth-generation Montanan. She showed horses in the 70s and 80s taught riding and judged horse shows, and today she's an attorney and operates an equine education and consulting business uh, here in Helena. Um, and her talk will cover centuries of racing in Montana from Lewis and Clark's guide staging horse races at Traveler's Rest to the heyday of horse racing in places like Helena and Anaconda where when ra racing was made respectable, and to back again to today, to today's Indian Relay Circuit, which is also a fascinating um, facet of horse racing. Um, and her new book is out and available for purchase today. She will also be, at the end of this talk, up by the bookstore signing books as well. And, of course, at the end of her talk, she will also answer questions. So, without further ado, Brenda Wait, Waller. <laughs> Thank you. And the colder air is coming from right there. <laughs> I think people will still know. Mm okay. Thank you, Sid. And thank you, Christine. I opened this with this quote from Ed Tipton, who worked for Marcus Daly. So for those of us in Montana, that's why we should care about Ed Tipton. And for those people in the thoroughbred racing industry, today there is the Facing Tipton Thoroughbred Sales Company, which runs the yearling sales at Keeneland that sell horses for millions and millions of dollars. Same Ed Tipton. So I think what better endorsement for horse racing in Montana than from somebody who became such a significant figure in the thoroughbred racing industry in America. To my idea, Montana is the greatest country on earth in which to race or hold races because the people there look upon racing as a sport worthy of patronage and they have the money to gratify their notions. Wages are good and the men who toil are amongst the best patrons of both the gate and the pool box. The women bet almost as much as the men. Racing in Montana started as soon as horses arrived. And this Huffman photograph has two different titles. Here at the museum in the photo archives, it's called Beef Issue Day at the Agency, 1901. This is at Lame Deer. Another title for this image is Indian Pony Race. And if you look at the dust, there are your horse is racing, and the folks on the other side of the image are at the finish line, and they'll help decide who's going to win. But the match race on a straightaway was the first way, get used to this, was the first horse racetracks in Montana. And when you drive down Interstate 90 and you go past Deer Lodge, you'll see a three-way exit called racetrack. And a lot of people think that was an oval racetrack, and it was not. It was an intertribal meeting ground where they held these type of match races. Now, the first thing I want to point out to go along with the museum's new exhibit on Ice Age megafauna in Montana is that the horse evolved in North America, and a lot of people don't realize that. And there have been fossil finds of early horse ancestors dug up right here in Montana. Um, Earl Douglas, who found the fossils that became Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, he was a school teacher at a one-room schoolhouse over in Madison County, went fossil digging in his, spare, in his spare time, 
dug up horse fossils over by the Madison Buffalo Jump. After he became famous as a paleontologist, he came back to Montana, unearthed more horse ancestor fossils near Winston, also down in Beaverhead County. They've found horse fossils in Madison County. Um, certainly the Mesohippus, the Mary Chippus, they have found the earliest horse that was genus Equus was called um, Equus simpli simplicidens. I'm having a word problem today. The Hagerman horse is its popular name. And that is the state fossil of Idaho. So what happened, and uh, I've, had a con I've had a conversation with folks here at the society about why they had no horses in their ice age exhibit, because the ancestral wild horse lived in North America until around eight to 10,000 years ago, when along with the mammoths and some of the other great megafauna of the Ice Age, the horse became extinct here. And in the process, though, it had migrated across the Bering Land Bridge into Eurasia and managed to survive in the Eastern Hemisphere until it was domesticated by humans and there's a lot of interesting studies about how domestication may be why we have horses today. There's an argument made that uh, had they simply been hunted as other animals were, they may have gone extinct right along with the mammoth. So the horse came back to America after about a 10,000 year absence. In 1519, when Cortez landed on the shores of Mexico with 16 horses. And things didn't go so well for the native people, but they picked up on the utility of the horse very, very quickly and made it their own. You have a map just outside this room that shows the trade routes of native people as they came from old Mexico north. And the horses traveled those trade routes. The People in the Southwest traded to the Utes, the Utes traded to the Shoshone, the Shoshone traded with everybody. The tribes that are now in Montana today, the first tribe to have horses here is thought to have been the Salish. Um, there's also a very good argument that the, the Absalica, the Crow, also may have gotten horses from the Shoshone about the same time, and given that we had no state lines back in those days, it's kind of hard to say which group got here first, but that's how the pathway went. Um, the Shoshone were very well known as excellent horse people. This is one of my favorite finds from the Historical Society. The title is Snake Indians Horse Racing. It's a, it's a very, very, very early Charlie Russell. It's from his boyhood sketchbook. This was before he had become a famous Artist, in fact, it was before he became a very good artist. If you take a look at it, it's like, meh. But you see down here we have CMR. He signed it. And in those days, he used a moccasin before he adopted the buffalo skull. And so I think it's interesting that as he's portraying his early images of horses, he's portraying the Shoshone, and he's portraying a horse race. So the Salish people by the time Lewis and Clark arrive, have become a horse culture, as has most of the native people across the West. We have the first documented, somebody writing down about a horse race in Montana, came from the Lewis and Clark expedition. When they were coming back from the coast in 1906, they stopped off at Traveler's Rest, and the last day before their Nez Perce guides turned around and went back home, they celebrated with foot races and horse races. And both Lewis and Clark wrote in their journals that the men amused themselves with horse racing. And so from there, Montana begins to settle. And first we have miners. And as soon as miners start building towns, they start building streets. And what do you do with a street? You race horses down the street, of course. And in Virginia City, this is Wallace Street. 
Wallace Street is now the highway that goes right through the middle of town. Wallace Street and Jackson Street were both completely blocked off every Sunday for horse racing. Down in Glendale, Montana, you see this long, the way the town was built along the gulch, about the only flat land there was. They put in the houses, the street between them, and of course, they ran horse races down Glendale, Montana's main street as well. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Now, miners needed to eat. They liked to eat beef. It was portable. It was on the hoof. <coughs> we know that any number of people made their fortune in the cattle industry, including Conrad Coors, who became a horse breeder as well as a cattle rancher. And so along with the cattle came the cowboys. And as Granville Stewart says here, each cowpuncher owned one or more fine saddle horses, often a thoroughbred on which he lavished his affections, and horse racing was one of his favorite sports. And again, now we have a little more mature Charlie Russell showing horses anatomically correct, moving correctly, much, much superior work. And now we have CMR with his classic signature that we all know so well. But Charlie Russell, he knew about horse racing. Now, heading east, the Fort Keogh Military Reservation grew up after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And part of that reservation started out with a little settlement nearby to sell supplies to the soldiers. And uh, Colonel Nelson A. Miles was not pleased that the traders were selling mostly alcohol to the soldiers, and so he made them move over across the river. And they graciously named their little community Milestown. Um, and so by 1882, we have a thriving community mixing military, cow hands, sheep herders, freighters, the railroads are coming. And again, what do you do when you've got a main street? you're going to race horses. And in Miles City, what they would do is they would station cowboys at the intersections to warn off pedestrians while they held their match races, which usually were organized every evening in the saloons to be run the next day. And some of the liveliness of Miles City helped the Montana Territorial Legislature say, you know, we've got to give cities the authority to ban horse racing in the streets. Just like today, we have the teenage kids cruising Maine and they'll drag race on a straightaway if you don't have the cops. Well, first they did that with horses. In Miles City, the Tongue River originally followed this path and then they channelized it. But this is a map from about 1907 showing that the fairgrounds in its current location, current race oval in its current location, existed at the time. And what we know is that the old, this is part of the old Fort Keogh military reservation, this section of town. And they had a racetrack at the fort. They held races at the fort. And it's possible this racetrack occupies the same footprint that has been around since the 1880s. But as we ban horse racing in the streets, we've got to get legitimate. We've got to build racetracks. And if you're going to build a racetrack, you want people to see the whole race. So you make it circular. And th that's why the circular racetrack was invented, was for the benefit of spectators. And some of the earliest ones were in Helen and Deer Lodge. The first organized horse racing meet was part of Montana's first territorial fair in 1868 in Helena. So we were the first here in town. And the first races were held at Madame Cody's circular race course at her two-mile house. I always love that it's the f favorite resort of pleasure seekers. It has the most elegant and sumptuous style, the finest liquors and choicest cigars in Montana. Um, about two years later, the current Helena Fairgrounds were built. The Helena Racetrack, the One Mile Oval, was opened for racing at the Territorial Fair of 1870. 
which, for those of you who are wondering, Churchill Downs did not open until 1876, so there. Um, this was the same year Pimlico opened, and you sometimes hear about Pimlico in Baltimore. That's the home of the Preakness Stakes. Well, Pimlico and Helena opened the same year. So from there, Deer Lodge did have a racetrack. They called it Olin's Course. There were a couple of others, and they had their first organized meet in 1869, drawing in local horses, horses from Helena, horses from Butte, and uh, generally a good time was had by all. This particular photograph is a postcard from 1909 showing a race meet in the Deer Lodge area. We also have documentation of a race meet in Bozeman in 1871. They called themselves the East Side Racing Association. And then Missoula opened their first track and had a meet in 1876. Now, for long, people get serious about bringing in very good horses. And we saw a picture earlier of Glendale, Montana. The person who put Glendale on the map was Noah Armstrong. Glendale was a silver mining center. Armstrong founded the Hequa Consolidated Mining Company in Glendale and promptly made a large fortune. And what do we do with a large fortune? We invested in racehorses. And that's the joke about that's how you make a small fortune. It's basically, it's a ghost town now. It's west of Melrose. If you go down I-15 toward Dillon, you see the Melrose exit. You take Melrose, um, and then you start uh, talking to the locals. It's, um, I believe that on a Google map, it still designates Glendale, and you can drive out the country roads and find a few of the old buildings that are left. So, yeah, it's, it's in that area of the state. Now, what Noah Armstrong did... We have, may have noticed that that picture of Glendale earlier, that it was built in some pretty mountainous territory. It's not exactly horse country. So he went over the mountains and found that the Jefferson River Valley was beautiful horse country. There he purchased a ranch, um, the basic land he bought from his daughter and son-in-law. Then he bought some surrounding ranches. And he built this structure which we now call the Don, he called it the Doncaster Round Barn, to house his horses. Um, if anybody was here for my talk last spring, the Doncaster Round Barn, there's a great deal of misinformation about Spokane. Some of it comes from Armstrong's son, Charles, who told a lot of exaggerations. He said that the barn had, uh, you, you could pull a wagon with 10 horses inside. Well, no, you can't. Um, inside this barn... There were 26 stalls, and you see all these little doors. Each of these little doors went to a stall for the horse. Each horse had a window. Then they had a paddock that would come out from their stall and kind of fan out. Um, unfortunately, there's some errors even in the National Register of Historic Places designation. They said that each paddock was two and a half acres. That's not true. Each paddock was still a pretty good sized place for each horse to go out and run around. But if you look at the fence line, and there's also a ghost footprint around the barn of Armstrong's half mile training track, the whole area encompassed about two and a half acres um, total for the horses, little running paddocks. Um, inside the barn, he had a track for exercising the horses during the winter. And when you measure the barn, it's about the size of a modern round pen. There's a, about a 60 to 70 foot round pen that you'll see people use to train horses. And that's about how much space the horses had to run around and exercise. Then as you follow this second wall down and the very core of the barn, there was um, some office space, veterinary facilities, tack room, assorted other things down on the first floor. The second floor was used entirely for hay and grain storage, 
And then the third floor housed a cistern for water. And there originally was a windmill on the top of this structure that pumped water. He had a well pipe that went clear down. The well was right under the barn, pumped the water up, stored it in a cistern, and then he had pipes that would allow it to be run down into the stall of each horse. And similarly, the second floor where they stored all of the hay, it also had chutes where people could push the hay down and feed all of the horses in the barn. Armstrong, when you see a barn with design like this and this much thought put into the structure, Armstrong was a horseman. And in, uh, at one point after he got his barn built, he named it the Doncaster Barn after a very famous racehorse in England. Not a horse that he owned, but it was a famous, there was a race course in England in Yorkshire called the Doncaster Race, um, Doncaster race Course. It still is in existence today. And in the late 1870s, a horse named Doncaster after the race course won the Epsom Derby, which for uh, people in England, they don't want us to call it the Epsom Derby. It is the Derby and not that upstart in Kentucky. But Doncaster was a horse that won at Epsom and was probably the most famous racehorse in his time. And so Noah Armstrong names his barn after the famous racehorse Doncaster, and that gives you an idea of how ambitious he was. Now, what happens with Armstrong is he goes back to Illinois. He buys a mare that is in foal to a very nice racehorse named Hyder Ali, puts her on a train, pregnant, ships her to Montana. The rail siding is going to be in Dillon, gets from Dillon, has to walk her, you know, with a probably ponied from another horse, two twin bridges so she can live at his nice barn. And she foals a little chestnut colt in 1886. Armstrong is away on business at the time. He's in the city of Spokane Falls, Washington Territory, when he gets word that Interpose has had her foal. And he says, well, I am so pleased with what wonderful people I've met here in Spokane Falls. Let's name that little foal Spokane. And so he was. Now, Spokane lived in Montana, grew up here, was broke to ride here by a young 16-year-old cowboy named uh, Redfern. And then when he was, after he was put under saddle in the spring of his two-year-old year, they either ponied him or rode him or somehow took him from Twin Bridges down the road to Dillon, put him on a train, shipped him to Tennessee, and put him into race training. His race trainer took him to the Kentucky Derby as a three-year-old in 1889. He was not quite a long shot, but he was at 10 to, odd, uh, 10 to 1 odds to win. There was a tremendous local favorite named Proctor Knott, and everybody, Proctor Knott was named after a person who was the governor of Kentucky, um, very, very popular politician, and everybody assumed that, I mean, you didn't even have to run the race because Proctor Knott was going to win. Well, Spokane had other ideas, and he beat him. And this puts Montana on the national scene as potential horse racing territory. Everybody was thrilled with Spokane's win in Illinois, where his sire and dam were born. Everybody was thrilled in Spokane. They're like, wow, this is the best free advertising we've ever seen. And so by the time Spokane gets to the American Derby in Chicago, the Spokane Falls um, Chamber of Commerce type of folks, the trade delegation had arrived. They had a fancy blanket ready for Spokane that said, Spokane, the Kentucky Derby winner, you know, gift of the people of Spokane Falls, Washington Territory. They had flyers, please come to Washington Territory. They were going through the stands, handing him out right and left. Spokane won the race. He beat Proctor Knott again. Um, and in general, they were very happy people. Noah Armstrong proudly declared Spokane a Montana horse and said the bunch grass of the Jefferson River Valley is superior to the bluegrass of Kentucky. 
And of course, the trainers from, from Tennessee, and Tennessee and Kentucky, you know, they, the Tennesseans were thrilled to have a horse trade in Tennessee beat Kentucky. Really, everybody was happy at Spokane won, except the people in Kentucky itself. Back in Montana, and I apologize, I've got a, a bad slide here, um, Marcus Daly, this should say Butte Anaconda and the Bitterett Stock Farm. Marcus Daly also made a large fortune in copper mining in Butte and proceeded to invest most of it in horses. And in his case, it never became a small fortune. He seemed to have a little, um, some pretty good race savvy, even though he spent a great deal of money. In 1888, he built the Anaconda Driving Park. And there were a couple of structures, a couple of generations, but this is what it looked like at its peak. We don't know for sure when this photograph was taken, but the structure burned down in 1911, so it's somewhere in the early 1900s. This is a two-story grandstand um, in front of an oval racetrack that was a mile long. Anaconda was probably, um, part of the reason this truck probably got built was to help daily promote his idea of Anaconda as the capital of Montana, and we all know about that great fight. There's um, the other part of his empire, though, was in the Bitterroot. And the Bitterroot stock farm, this map sort of shows you the city of Hamilton down here. This was Daly's one-mile race course. This is about where the uh, ballpark in Hamilton is today. This end right about here is um, when the, you come in on the east side highway, how the road comes down and it curves. That east side highway comes into Hamilton, basically crossing the final turn of the old track. Um, the Daly Mansion, Riverside, was up here. And this gives you an idea of the scope of the stock farm. He ultimately owned 22,000 acres. He brought in thoroughbreds, standard breds, which in those days they'd call them trotters or pacers. The idea of the, of the harness horses as breed was still kind of in its early stages. He had draft horses for farming. He had even Shetland ponies. At its peak, the Bitterroot Stock Farm held 1,200 horses. And I, um, this is an example. This painting hangs in the Mansfield Library at the University of Montana. If you walk in the library there, you look over toward the computer lab, you'll see this one and another large painting, both of the stock farm, painted by Henry Cross. This particular one is of the mares, and that's almost the view you have off the back porch of the Daly Mansion in Hamilton today. The horses that Daly brought to the stock farm were of the highest quality. Some of the best known were his champion trotting sire, Prodigal. Um, you can always tell when you're dealing with a harness horse or a trotting horse in these old paintings because they show them at a trot. And when they have the extended hind leg and the extended forelegs, that shows you that they're in a racing trot. Um, I get a kick out of this particular painting because the pony rider is on this very upset, angry horse. His mouth is open, his ears are back. The guy's holding back the horse. You can tell by the way this horse was improperly drawn with the hind legs out behind. They're trying to portray that this horse is galloping to keep up with Prodigal and that Prodigal at a trot is still beating his pony horse. So there's a lot of entertaining things there. Um, Ogden is this horse. And this particular painting is here at the Society. It's uh, in storage right now. Um, it was a, Henry Stull was not the greatest horse painter on the planet, but Daly hired both Henry Stull and Henry Cross to come out to Montana, each of them spending quite a significant amount of time out here just to paint his horses. And it would be um, an art person who can hunt down these old paintings. He, he had, there's at least eight or ten paintings of daily horses that exist, and I would love to find where more of them are. Ogden was imported from England as a foal. Marcus Daly purchased a ranch or a small, I shouldn't say a ranch, he purchased a small farm in England that was called Apperfield Court. And at Apperfield Court, he sent Ed Tipton, 
over to England um, to look at horses. He also sent some other people. Uh, he had a veterinarian named Hagyard, who the Hagyard Equine Veterinary Medical Center is today one of the most famous private equine practices in Kentucky. So again, state-of-the-art people, the best there were, still famous today. In England, they bought the best of the horses that Daly could get his hands on, gathered them at Apperfield Court, and then shipped them to America. Oriole's, uh, Oriole was the dam of Ogden, and he was, we think, a suckling foal. There's some tales that he was named Ogden because he was foaled in Ogden, Utah. That is not correct. We're not quite sure why he was named Ogden. There's also a story that the train broke down in Ogden, Utah. But at any rate, Oriole and Ogden came from England on the boat, on the train, all the way across the country to the Bitterroot Stock Farm. And Ogden becomes a very good racehorse, but he never ran worth a dang in the springtime. And this is possibly because, I, this is kind of my theory talking now, I suspect that when you are a suckling foal or a weanling foal, you're not very big, but first you're on a steam steamship for quite some time crossing the Atlantic, then you get put on a noisy train and you're hauled across the country for you know a couple of weeks. You're maybe not going to grow up quite as fast as all your um, classmates in the same crop year. And so I suspect he was a little small. And as a two-year-old, when he was put in race training, he was not particularly impressive early on, so Daly kept him here in Montana. Sent him over to the races in Butte and Anaconda in July, and all of a sudden, he started winning. And when he won three races in a row, Daly said, okay, let's ship him east. And he went east with Daly's Montana trainer because his East Coast trainer who is the fellow in this image with the mustache, Matt Burns. He was pretty much busy. He had his string. And there's a tale that at the Futurity Stakes in New York, which Ogden won quite impressively, that Daly was have said to the jockey, you know, in a great Irish brogue, now you don't worry about... All those other jockeys, they think you're just a crazy cowboy anyway, so you know you just you know scare them off, and they'll think you're a lunatic, and you're going to win. Ogden won the Futurity Stakes. He stayed in the East Coast. He went into training with Burns. The next spring, he was set to be the favorite for the Belmont Stakes. That's the test of the champion of famous race still run won today. Well, remember, Ogden doesn't do very well in the spring. But there was another colt from the Daly Stable who had run the Futurity Stakes the previous year, hadn't done particularly well. Daly didn't really like him. His name was Scottish Chieftain. And there's even a copy of Daly's Stock Farm catalog where he annotated little comments about every horse and said about the Chieftain, good, but needs selling. Wasn't his favorite. Well, the chieftain gets entered in the Belmont along with Ogden to be a rabbit. And a rabbit, in horse racing terminology, is a speedy horse at the beginning of the race who draws all the other horses to chase him. Therefore, they get worn out and tired. And then the horse that's intended to win can come behind, pass all the tired horses, and win. It's a mildly disreputable strategy, but it's also a very common one, and they still do it today. You don't admit you're doing it, of course. So the Daily Stables has two entries. The chieftain does what he's supposed to do, and he takes off, and he's got his early speed. And then he must look over his shoulder. He sees a horse from the Whitney Stables. He looks over his other shoulder. He sees another horse from the Whitney Stables, and they're double-teaming him. And he just decides it's his day. And he just keeps on going, pours on the speed, and wins the Belmont Stakes. Ogden came in last. He doesn't run well in the spring. But Ogden redeemed himself later, went on to win other races, and was retired to stud at the Bitterroot Stock Farm. This next brings us to the chestnut horse that we see in the top image, and whose image is repeated in this wood inlay mosaic. And that is none other 
than Tammany. Tammany was Daly's favorite. He purchased him as a yearling um, back in the Midwest. He brought him to the stock farm as a young horse, let him grow up here a little bit, sent him east. He did well enough as a three-year-old, and then as a four-year-old, he met his great rival, a horse named Lamplighter. And they had sort of been challenging each other, and daily had been trash-talking Lamplighter's owner for months, and his Lamplighter's owner was saying that Daly was a chicken and his horse wasn't good enough. Finally, the two of them meet in a match race, and Daly declares, if Tammany wins, I'll build him a castle. And so Tammany did, in fact, beat the great lamplighter. At that time, it was said that the whole town of Anaconda closed all the businesses and threw a very big party. Everybody was happy. He brings Tammany back to the Bitterroot and begins construction on the castle. Tammany's castle still stands today. It has been converted into a house um, that I'm sure is quite valuable. This is a photograph of Tammany in his castle, and you'll notice brick walls, a little bit of uh, taxidermy displays, little shelf. They, they claimed that, that he had fresh roses placed in front of his stall every day. I don't see any roses there right now, so probably it was just for the good events. Um, floors were cork to be easier on his legs. There's a legend that the walls were covered in velvet. I, I've in the past said I don't think so. Horses would eat velvet coverings quite quickly. Um, however, I wouldn't be surprised. There was another researcher, a, a woman in Hamilton, who did a lot of local history work named Ada Powell. And she believed that they may have at least initially covered the walls of his stalls with old car with carpeting. And I, I could kind of see them doing that. Oh, you know, let's put carpet on his walls so he doesn't, you know, bump himself or mar his perfection. So that was the story of Tammany. Now, Daly died in 1900. But before he had passed away, in the time that he was building up the stock farm, he also purchased the racetrack in Butte. Butte had had a track um, in, the, in the 1880s. There was, there's race meets that go back about that far, and there was probably racing before that. But in 1896, Daly takes over the West Side Racing Association, purchases the track, the grounds, tears down the previous structures, and builds the Butte Jockey Club. And this was a three-story grandstand. There are Sanford insurance maps here in the archives that show that there were about 32 horse barns attached to this track. There were eight cook houses to feed everybody who worked there. The cable car line, and again, Daly owns that in Butte, they had already run a rail line out to the track back in 1890. Daly gave his miners days off with pay to go to the track. I'm sure he probably won a lot of their salaries back in the takeout from the handle. But um, the Butte Jockey Club drew in horses from all over the United States. They shipped in from California. They shipped in from Chicago. Ed Tipton was running the meet. They ran 60 days a year. And then Anaconda ran another 30 days after that. This also benefited the meets in places like Helena and Bozeman and Deer Lodge, who ran meets partly with local horses overlapping. They also kind of ran at the beginning of the end. You could ship a horse from Chicago, put him on the train, come to Montana in early May, race all summer out here, and the trotting horses, the purses were so good in Montana, a trotter could make more money in Montana than they could in California or Chicago. That's how big racing once was in Montana, and I've called it our first golden age. Now, uh, just throwing in some photographs, um, these are just great pictures. We have one from Bozeman in 1903, one from Butte 1905. 
I, I just love these characters. A lot of them were boys. They didn't have the rule that you had to be 16 to ride a racehorse. You saw horse races where the jockeys were weighing in at 85 and 90 pounds, so you know they were putting on kids. Um, I think in this photo especially, you know, you see a couple of faces of very small, not just full-grown people, but, but youngsters as well. And then this judge's stand in Bozeman, um, there's members of the Story family up there and some of the greater lights of Bozeman judging the finishes of these race meets. And I always love just that moment in time. Over here you've got the cop kind of looking askance at our jockey complete with cigar and some sort of beverage. Um, I just, uh, I, it's just a great shot of the times. But then we have all kinds of trouble. The progressive era denounces gambling as a moral vice. First, they ban pool room gambling on race horses, and there's all sorts of wonderful tales out of Butte about how that was a problem. Then, in 1909, they also limited races to no more than 30 days in a county of the first class. At that time, that was only Butte, so guess what they were trying to do? Kill the 60-day meet and to only 14 days in a county of the second class, which there was only one town racing more than 14 days, and that was Anaconda. So they were slapping at the horse racing industry quite directly. And after any number of shenanigans where people were trying to push those laws, they finally dropped the hammer and just abolished gambling, period. You could not bet on horse races anymore. Now, you could still race horses for a jackpot. You could, you know, but without the gambling, without the betting money, there just wasn't the money to run these meets. Butte Jockey Club folds, tears down the grandstand, sells it off in parcels. Um, what is left is now there's some open ground by East Middle School, and between East Middle School and the uh, racetrack fire department, that racetrack neighborhood of Butte is roughly where that track is. And it's been built over today. Helena didn't go down without a fight. They kept running. And in the 1925 fair, Governor Erickson's chief legal counsel, a gentleman named Toomey, decided to go to the fair where they had what they called a co-ownership arrangement. Now, co-ownership was not gambling on horse racing. You would buy a share in a racehorse. Then you would go to the window and you would pay $2 as your entry fee, your share of the entry fee in getting that horse in the race. And that money went into a jackpot and if your horse won, the jackpot was split amongst you and your fellow horse owners. We're not gonna call that paramutual wagering, no, that would be illegal. Well, Mr. Toomey bet on a horse named Florence Fryer. That was his first mistake. Florence Fryer did not win the race. So Mr. Toomey sued the fair board. He said he'd lost his $2 gambling in an illegal game. He was wronged. The fair board promptly hired a former federal judge, a former Supreme Court justice, and a young energetic up-and-coming attorney named Lester Lobel. That crack legal team defended the fair board all the way to the Supreme Court, and in 1926, a unanimous Montana Supreme Court held that horse racing wasn't illegal, and putting entry fees into a jackpot wasn't illegal. Sorry, Mr. Toomey, you lose. This, of course, eviscerates the anti-gambling law, all of a sudden the machines to calculate these wagers come racing into Montana and the legislature legalizes paramutual wagering officially in 1929. Um, if you go to the 1929 statute, the way they worded that statute, I looked at it until I was cross-eyed, until I read the Toomey decision and realized they copied the language that the Supreme Court used in Toomey, so they didn't use the word gambling anywhere. With that, we start to see the tracks slowly revive. 
Along the way, there are two young up-and-coming jockeys who pass through Montana on their way from their homes in Canada um, and then went on to greater things. One boy dumped off in Butte in the 20s. He had a guardian that was supposed to take care of him. The guy just dumped him, left him, and he kind of made the best of it in what was left of a, there's kind of a little bush track in Butte that ran in the 20s. It was in Butte, he got his nickname Red, and his name was Red Pollard. <coughs> he met up with another Canadian who's not pictured here, who was born in Cardston, Alberta, but his dad ran a stage route between Cardston and Bab, and for a time came down to Montana and lived near Bab. This young gentleman was named George Wolfe. George Wolfe probably learned to ride racehorses, challenging the boys on the Blackfeet Reservation. George Wolfe also was famous as a jockey who rode Sea Biscuit. He gained the nickname the Iceman, and there is now a statue of Wolfe at Santa Anita Racetrack in Los Angeles. Another young man was born in Bozeman in 1915. His parents later moved to Calgary, and he spent money of his growing up years in Alberta, so the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame claims him as a Canadian. But he was born in Bozeman. And in high school, they sent him back to Bozeman to live with his uncle, Guy Saunders. He was supposed to finish high school, but he started riding the race meets on our little tracks, on our little county fairs throughout the 20s. And by the 30s, decided it was time to head for bigger things. First, he goes to California, starts winning big races. Then he goes east, where he catches the eye of the lead trainer for the Bel Air Stables, a trainer who is famous to history as Sonny Jim Fitzsimmons. Fitzsimmons puts him on a horse named Count Fleet. Count Fleet wins the Triple Crown in 1935. So Montana was also not just horse country, but horseman country as well. Now, back to Montana. With paramutual racing legalized, but the Great Depression hits at the same time, there's quite a bit of turmoil as far as who's going to race. Helena shuts down. They claim people can't afford the admission to the fair. They're not going to have horse racing. But in the meantime, Great Falls is building the fairgrounds they have today. They had a previous history of racing at Black Eagle Park. They had also raced on another track on the west side of town. They called it the west side track. I have found the footprint still exists. It's in an area they call Watson Cooley um, that is sort of west of, sort of northwest of Great Falls. But they complete their fairgrounds and open it to racing in 1931. It is the same place that exists today. Great Falls also was the home of Montana Horse Racing Greatest Tragedy when they combined their first air show with the state fair, the planes from the Army base that is now Malmstrom. They brought in three bombers to buzz the fairgrounds. The planes got too close. The wing of one plane clipped off the tail section of another plane. This chunk of stuff is the tail section, landed on the track. This air show occurred between the first and second races, so there weren't horses on the track, but you can see this is the starting gate being pulled by a team of horses. The plane that lost its tail hit the ground at the final turn of the track, skidded through the horse barns, set one barn on fire. Um, the pilots clearly perished in the crash, so did three other people on the ground and 19 horses. Um, they have now, if you notice, they've now taken the barns. The barns are now over on the other side of the track. And the air shows, um, there was one year where they had the uh, Thunderbirds. They were flying over the fairgrounds during their air show, but several thousand feet in the air, not 500 feet above the ground. This was the first day that Great Falls revived racing. They had had a gap between 1910 and 1931. Aerial photo, 
They had a horse um, win $186 on a $2 paramutual bet that headlined the second day of the fair's news. And again, for anybody who follows the Great Falls State Fair, there are your grandstands. Um, they were built onto, they were remodeled. They did have to tear them down at the end of 2018, but they've put up a new structure and Great Falls is still racing today. Now, in, I'm going to fast forward through the World War II and, the, and through the 50s because racing was pretty much at the county fair level in that time. But in the 60s, the uh, horse racing begins to revitalize again. And this began with a gentleman named Lloyd Shellhammer who built his own private race club called the Beaumont Downs in Belgrade, Montana. His idea was to have a supper club, a racetrack, year-round entertainment. He brought in, he had two bars, he had bands from Las Vegas, he had lobster thermidor and frog's legs on the menu, and you can see the supper club, there was 160 feet of glass so anyone sitting in the restaurant could watch the horse races. And for just a little more than 10 years, the Beaumont was the hottest place, not just in town, but the hottest place in the state. And this is just an example of, this was a quarter horse named Robert Beaver. We're not quite sure why he was named Robert Beaver. The little boy in this photo is Tom Tucker, who is uh, now an adult. He's the executive secretary of the Montana Board of Horse Racing and was extremely helpful to me in working on my book. But the horse, Robert Beaver, he was a quarter horse. Um, one of the things that Shellhammer did is that he petitioned the American Quarter Horse Association, which was brand new at the time, to certify the Beaumont track for quarter mile races. And it was about a 5 8 mile oval and then it had a big long straightaway shoot for the quarter horse racing. Horses ran for about $100 a race. You couldn't make a whole lot of money, but he could do, at times he would have these loss leaders. He also had the biggest purse in Montana at the time. In 1964, he ran a quarter horse race for $70,000. Um, so these were the ways that the Beaumont tried to make a go of things. In the meantime, the equipment that Shellhammer got included a paramutual tote board that could be moved with a 18-wheeler with a tractor, and he started taking that tote board to fairs across the state so that everybody could have paramutual wagering. He made that company into United Tote. It went public. It was, at one point in time, the first um, totalizator company to computerize racetrack betting. Um, he made millions. He retired a millionaire. And... Uh, United Tote still exists today. It is now owned by Churchill Downs Incorporated. Great Falls is still running today. I was delighted to find the picture from 1947, shot the same angle in 2018. Um, it's one of the surviving tracks. We only have two left. The other is Miles City that runs the Bucking Horse Sale every year. And two week, the horses race for two weekends. I always thought that this photograph, uh, Mary Peters takes amazing rodeo photographs, and she'd also taken pictures of the horse races in, in the past. I love how they have the bucking horse right in front of the tote board showing the bets for the next race. Miles City combined racing with the bucking horse sale with such success that in 2012, which was one of the worst years for Montana racing, they were the only track still running. And it was because the race horses helped support the bucking horse sale, the bucking horse sale helped support the race meet. They could actually run a race meet on their own without the input of the simulcast money that helps support other tracks. Um, this is just a quick timeline of some of the Things that have impacted Montana racing in the late 20th century. We formed the Montana Horse Racing Commission in 1965. It became the Board of Horse Racing in 1972 with our new constitution that allowed any form of gambling that was approved by either the legislature or by voter referendum. Horse racing grew dramatically 
after the 72 Constitution. In 1984, we had 143 days of racing, wagering handle of 11.8 million. That's how much money people bet, and most of it comes back to them, but some of it stays with the track and goes to taxes. But unfortunately, video gaming moved our betting world and the people who want to wager on things from the tracks to the taverns. Lottery had some impact, it didn't help. And by 1994, the wagering handle has dropped by more than half. Um, today, we have two licensed tracks. In 2018, the wagering handle total was about just over half a million dollars. Kind of gives you a sense of, of how, the, uh, how racing has changed and why. When people say, why did the tracks shut down, this was a very, very big part of it. Um, insurance and some other issues have also played a role both here and nationally. But racing also has a future in Montana's Indian reservations. The North American Indian Days in Browning runs both Indian relay and traditional flat races. And this is an example of one of their traditional races. They have a starting gate. Everybody's got to wear their protective vests and their helmets. You recognize the number towels on the horses, sort of like I have number towels below the screen here in the front of this room. The number one horse, El Bardi Countess, written by Holly Gervais, um, owned by the Bird Rattler family, who are one of the major, major supporters of Montana racing, both on the reservations and at the meets, especially in Great Falls. And the other major meet is at Crow Fair, and they too have not only Indian relay, such as is shown in this photo, but they have traditional flat track racing as well, and uh, essentially the Blackfeet tribe is working to purchase a lot of the uh, equipment from Kalispell, because Kalispell used to race but no longer is. Crow Fair, um, Crow tribe is starting to pick up some of the equipment out of Billings, and they are continuing to keep horse racing alive here in Montana. It's, in, it's intense, yeah. it's intense. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes, and if we want to go ahead and bring the lights up, I can take questions. Other comments from the audience? Um, at the Montana Historical Society conference that was just a couple of weeks back, they paired me up with Kendall Oldhorn, and he did a talk on Indian Relay and showed us some of the clips from that independent lens documentary. It's amazing. So any questions about racing here or other parts of Montana? Uh-huh. Well, what these are, I'll pull one up for you. Yes, um, the question was what these blankets are and if they're all the same size. These are, some people call them a number towel or a number blanket. They are the same size. They go underneath the racing saddle on the horse's back so that, and I believe I can show you in one of the earlier pictures. As you see here, this number three horse has a number three blanket. It would go like this. And this allows people to know identify each individual horse in the race. So that, that's what they're for. I, uh, the Western Montana Turf Club donated a number of these to the Historical Society along with um, Tony Hinton. She had some racing equipment, an exercise saddle, and some other things. And so the Historical Society now does have some vintage horse equipment. What it is is that the owners ride, um, they can do it two ways. These come from the track, and the numbers are defined by the racetrack. They have to do a random draw to determine which horse has which post position. But what people who own racehorses do, they may choose to do such as what Marcus Daly did and register a unique pattern for their jockey's jacket and cap, they call these racing silks or racing colors. In the case of Marcus Daly, you can see he used copper, green, and silver as his racing colors. Um, 
At the smaller tracks, such as here in Montana, I'll show you this Great Falls picture. It gives you a good example of how modern racing works. Most of the people in the smaller races in Montana simply use what we call track silks, like this rider, he's all in red and he's got the red blanket for the number one horse. Um, rider in black, number five, she's all in black. Number two is all in white, number, I think it's number six in yellow and number seven in purple. Um, the colors are standardized by state regulation and riders can either use the track colors or if they have their own silk designs, they can certainly, or the owners I should say, they can certainly ask the jockeys to wear their own racing silks. But I was talking to a racehorse owner one time and I said, well, you know, how come the jockeys are all wearing the track silks and not the uh, racing silks? And he said, well, racing silks are custom, they're kind of expensive, they get trashed because they're being handled pretty, pretty rough out there on the track. And so um, that's how that works. Did I see another hand over here somewhere? Yes. Is it true that I love the story about whether or not there was soil on the track of Helena from Kentucky. I'm going to take the fifth on your second question of who made that god-awful decision to pave the home stretch and put a building in the middle of it. I was in, Part of the genesis of this book was that I was on the Save the Track group, and we were trying to prevent that from happening, but it didn't come to be, so I'll just, I'm taking the fifth. Um, but as far as the Helena Track, here's what I know. There was some evidence that the Hamilton One Mile Oval that Marcus Daly built for his stock farm, if we go back, um, this One Mile Oval on the map here, the railroad, as you can see, goes running right past it. And there is some evidence that Daly shipped in a boxcar load of Kentucky soil to dump on his track in Hamilton. Now, I tried to find evidence that the Helena track had Kentucky soil. I have not yet been able to verify it. The Helena track was renovated in the, a couple of times. It was renovated in the early 1900s. It was built in 1870. Um, my guess is one of two things happened with Helena. Either, I know somebody had told me one time, they said, well, Marcus Daly brought in that soil to put on the Helena track, and of course, we all know that Helena was W.A. Clark's territory for the capital fight. There's absolutely no way that Marcus Daly would be bringing Kentucky soil to Helena. Not going to happen. Um, there was a renovation in the early 1900s. Again, somebody's going to have to go through old newspapers. I could find no news reports. You'd think that if something like that happened, there would have been a story about it in the paper somewhere. So I would say that it's unproven that there was Kentucky soil at the Helena track. If there was, it's not impossible that Clark might have done something like that in Helena because he hated Marcus Daly so much. He actually g developed his own racing stable. He, he personally was not that interested in racehorses. Um, when he was at Columbia Gardens, they closed down the track that was at Columbia Gardens when he body tore it out and didn't care. Um, but he did have a small racing stable. And in the early 1900s, when of course he was at the peak of his notoriety, the daily, race, the, the daily Racing Forum had this just snarky article about Clark's racing stable, and they just dismissed it as, he's a wealthy dilettante obsessed with vanquishing Marcus Daly in every possible way, and we don't have to pay any attention to him. So I, I have no idea. I would love somebody to prove that Helena Track tale because it keeps coming around, and... Either people were confusing it with the Hamilton track, or it may have been part of the renovation that occurred in 1906. Yes? Um, 
I suspect that even one boxcar load would be mostly symbolic. Um, you know, putting it on the home stretch. Yeah, I, I know that when Great Falls renovated their track, they brought in, you know, clay and sand and all kinds of mix. And uh, the amount of dirt that it takes to make a whole racetrack is far more than one train boxcar full. So I, I suspect it was mostly a, a symbolic thing. Plowed under within the first spring, I'm sure. Any other questions? Yes. I think of, of uh, human runners, um, they often train at higher altitudes, so they want a certain place for the foals and whatever. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to that. I think that training at high, you know, training at altitude helping humans, training at altitude possibly helping horses. We, we have a, a fairly famous modern horse um, that is standing at stud in Kentucky today named Medaglia Dioro. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. It's like the coffee brand. He was bred by Art and Joyce Bell in Great Falls. Um, they had him fold out in Kentucky because that's where the uh, breeder incentives are much better. But he won a number of major handicaps across the country. He didn't win the Derby, but he ran in it. Um, and has retired to stud. He's very, very well known. After his dam foaled him in Kentucky, her name was Cappuccino Bay, um, the Bells shipped her and her foal back to Montana, and Medaglia Dioro grew up in Montana. He, from basically about the time he was weaned, he was about three months old when he came here, so he wasn't quite weaned yet, probably. But from the time he was a foal until he went into race training, he grew up in Montana. Um, Spokane grew up in Montana. Scottish Chieftain grew up in Montana. Ogden grew up in Montana. Tammany spent from at least a year in Montana. Certainly, horsemen in Montana say that our altitude helps young horses develop better lungs, better, you know, better heart, better bone. Um, People, on the other hand, if they're in California or they're in Kentucky or they're in Florida, they're kind of daunted by the winters. And uh, that seems to discourage the people who want to make Montana into a mecca for raising young racehorses. I, I don't know what that is about that, 40 below. No. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. okay. Qu any further questions? Yes. I Mm -hmm. Ah, Keeneland, yes, Mecca. What happened with the Daily Horse was actually even more complicated. When he died in 1900, remember Ed Tipton? Well, Tipton had retired from Daly's employment and had already started facing Tipton Sales Company. The Daily Horses actually were put on a train and shipped off to New York City, most of them. Not all of them, but the, the best. And there was, in uh, early 1901, a three-day sale in Madison Square Garden of the Daily Stock. James Keene bought a number of them. In fact, I think he bought Oriel. Um, he did not buy Ogden. Ogden had a more complicated story. But the... Uh, yeah, Keen, a really good story about James Keene was that he purchased one of Daly's mares at that sale who was, um, it was a kind of a complex story, but she had been bred in England, shipped over to the States. Um, Daly ever, never actually saw the mare, but Keene bought this mare in foal, and the foal she produced was named Sissonby. And that young horse was, uh, he, he died rather tragically as a four-year-old, but he became such a renowned racehorse, he's considered one of the greatest, 100 greatest racehorses of the 20th century. When he died, he was buried in the infield of the racetrack where he won most of his races. And there was actually a funeral that 400, about 4,000 racing fans attended. So that was the impact of Daly's horses on everyone else in America. If Daly had lived another 10 years, we'd still be talking about the Daly legacy in horse racing. He, he bought the right animals. So, yes, I'd love to go to Keeneland. It's on my bucket list. 
Kentucky. Um, Keeneland is a, uh, there's, um, there's a racetrack there, International Museum of the Horse in Lexington. It's all part of a, a complex of sales and uh, there's a library there. It's, uh, the Keeneland Sales Company is uh, kind of a competitor to Facing Tipton as a place where they have the yearling sales for thoroughbreds. When people say Keeneland, they immediately think of the big horse racing auctions where the folks from the Middle East with a lot of oil money show up and spend tens of millions of dollars. So. so where is racing big in the United States? New York, California, Florida, Kentucky. Those are the big places. Um, other states have a history of horse racing, certainly Illinois and Chicago, um, Pimlico um, in Baltimore, um, Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area used to be quite a hotbed, still has some racing. We have Emerald Downs out in Seattle, fairly close to here, Canterbury Park in Minnesota. So there's still, the tracks are struggling, but there's now there's more centers and they tend to run year round. Um, a lot of the folks in Kentucky then ship south to Oakland Park in Arkansas um, to run during the winter. So that's kind of, there's these north-south um, circuits that are left. So, oh, so. oh Christine. Yes, um, I, I didn't have any, yeah, I didn't have any racing photos of the sulky horses. I probably should have added a couple. This image of Prodigal, they would, they would just, they hook them to a, a very small, lightweight, two-wheeled cart. They call it a sulky, um, kind of as they describe the tires today of the modern racing sulky, sort of like bicycle tires. And they do, they race at a trot, and in fact, they break into a gallop. They have to be pulled back. They lose time. Um, if they don't pull them back, they're disqualified. Harness racing is a very small niche part of the horse racing world today. Um, popular in certain areas, quite popular in Scandinavia, Russia, parts of the United States, particularly uh, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, some of that country. The Meadowlands in New Jersey still has trot racing. There is still harness racing in California. Harness racing declined with the invention of the automobile because harness racing was what the common man could do. You could have your fast little buggy horse, and you could, you know, if you were the doctor making your rounds with your buggy horse, you could also enter him in the races on Saturday and win a little money. Um, so as the automobile replaced the horse, there were fewer buggy horses, fewer harness horses, and um, now we have NASCAR. Oh, are you? Okay. Well, I'm a, I've always had horses. My dad had a ranch. Um, I got a pony when I was eight. I showed horses, that sort of thing. The horse racing was not something I was directly involved with, but certainly when I was a kid, and I did a lot of showing in the 70s, that was when racing was at its peak, and, you know, there was sort of this line, you know, you don't go down to the horse racing barns, you stay on this side of the line if you're a horse show person. Um, occasionally, I would be at a horse show where they were running race meets at the same time. You could watch the races. I later just, I think the Save the Track fight really helped me understand how much the horse racing industry financially supports every other aspect of the horse world. This is where the veterinary research into breeding, into reproduction, lameness, um, how do we protect horses' legs? How do we make them sounder and healthier? Um, what should we feed horses? What makes them healthier, you know, have a better digestive system? How do we shoe them? The racehorse industry financially underpins really every other aspect of the horse world today, and that's something that's not really as well known or understood as it could be. And so that was part of it as well. And of course, when I was a kid, I read the Black Stallion books, just like everybody else, whoever was a baby boomer. Um, you know, I just, I've always loved horses in any way they can be. And so that's where we have that. Well, with that, we are out of time. And I just want everyone to have another round of applause for Brenda Waller. That was wonderful. Thank you.
Um, and if you do want to continue the conversation or learn some more,